Uh, good evening, everyone. I would like to welcome you all uh, again in uh, Science Academy uh, webinar sponsored by uh, Saudi Association of uh, Neurosurgery. Uh, today, we are going to have uh, Professor Saleh Baisa, one of the senior consultants uh, in the kingdom. And uh, we are so happy to have you, Professor, to talk about the current science of trust. Thank you for joining us. Shukran Ahmed, assalamu alaikum everybody. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, current stenosis. It's a, it's a very large topic, and I'm going to try to be very uh, you know comprehensive, and I will highlight the important thing um, uh, in the management of these cases. Sorry, I have to advance. There you go. Uh, so the objective of my talk here will be, I'm gonna introduce the topic very briefly for you guys. We'll talk about the types and classifications, uh, how to evaluate those cases clinically and uh, by imaging wise, and how to manage. There are many types of current stenosis, as you know, and we're gonna go over uh, some of the types uh, in the management. We're going to highlight about the complication as well and the follow-up. And we're going to touch uh, briefly on the impact of COVID-19 on the uh, current stenosis management and uh, surgery and timing. Um, we always like to go back to embryology and uh, sometimes it's painful for everybody, but uh, just briefly uh, to uh, mention that the, the, the cranium is made uh, by the mesoderm. This then is spread into two parts, the uh, neurocranium and the visual cranium. For the facial bone, visual cranium is the main source um, for the uh, uh, primitive formation of, the, uh, of these bones from the uh, mesoderm. The neurocranium, it covers the skull, the skull base, and the, and the cranium. Also, the neurocranium is separated into two parts, um, the, the, the chondrocranium, which is a cartilaginous part, which is uh, for the skull base, and the dermatocranium, which is for the flat bones for the, for the cranium. And these separated by sutures, uh, well known for the embryologist called the mindonosal suture, which separate um, the, the cartilaginous, the skull base from the calvarium. And uh, the, it can uh, start as early as uh, fifth week uh, uh, of the gestation. And then the calvarium or the flat bone are made by the membranous type of the new cranium. So there is overlap between the, uh, the, the calvarium and the skull base, and that's why the theory of, of which one is causing which. Uh, for example, if you remember that uh, Moss uh, uh, and his colleagues, uh, he's with the theory that the skull base abnormality that initiated the current sources, while um, uh, other uh, uh, group uh, mentioned that um, uh, it's, it's the suture itself uh, has been affected and it's causing um, the current stenosis, which is the membranous part only. And uh, at birth, you're gonna end up having this classic uh, cranial anatomy uh, uh, with, with 10 bones separated by eight sutures, and there are up to um, uh, 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 six fontanelles. The, the most important and has a clinical significance is the anterior one. Now, the cranial modeling, uh, everybody here is totally different than others. So there is some genetic influence. Uh, this is, goes uh, transmitted by the parents and, and uh, intergeneration. However, there are some intra uh, uh, factors that can, can uh, uh, model the skull and into an abnormal shape, not necessarily cranial like abnormal uterus anatomy or twins and, and pelvic restraints. This can produce some abnormal skull. And it can get called initially by, uh, by the pediatrician uh, with a baby delivered because of his head, head is a bit long, it's abnormal. And usually we have to wait for a few days, few weeks, and usually it will remodel by, uh, with time. The heterogenic, um, this is uh, uh, something that made do either doing surgery, doing craniotomy for infants, and then there is inappropriate uh, healing of the craniotomy site can give you abnormal head shape and can give you a deformed skull. Or if you put a shunt in a, an infant who has large head with a big ventricles, with time it will collapse. The the bones will overlap and give you abnormal or secondary type of craniostenosis. We're interested now here is about the idiopathic type uh, of craniostenosis. 
And um, this picture I took from neurosurgery, this is published like more than 20 years in one of the, when I was a resident, and it showed uh, in the historical about uh, cancer histosis. There are some tribes where when their baby born, they put a wrap around the head, so it will model the head to be elongated. It's something like a royalty thing for those special uh, people that when, you, when they walk uh, around in, in public, they are recognized because, because of their head. So there are a lot of changes on the uh, iatrogenic part of the head abnormality. Now we'll go back to basics. So we define cancer source as it's a congenital disorder uh, where there is some uh, uh, premature uh, closure or, or fusion of one or more uh, suture uh, of the skull. And uh, it's not very rare, actually. We see a, a, a cases up to one to two cases per month and some time. And it's in most of the, uh, uh, the literature is about three to five per 10,000 live birth. The incidence in Saudi Arabia is not very clear. Um, and and, and so sometimes there is uh, also some uh, abnormality in the, in the face, usually the forehead and the nose of deviation, even with a single synostosis, not necessarily to be a syndrome. Uh, the deformity varies and uh, uh, with the number of sutures involved and associated anomaly, uh, namely the extremities, which can be obvious at birth. Uh, it's nice to go back to the history of uh, current synestosis, how it's been discovered, what are the evolution of the management. Uh, and uh, if you read the history, Otto in the long time ago, uh, he was the first one to recognize the abnormality that the sutures close or fuse. And he termed it as uh, sinostosis or cranial sinostosis. Burkhaus, then he described how the skull growth um, uh, and the growth will become perpendicular to the fused uh, sutures, which uh, he is one of the believers that the membranous uh, type uh, is the, uh, the default in the um, embryology. Um, Nan and uh, Longo uh, uh, described the initial management of cranial sinostosis, where they resect the, the fused. Uh, sutures, and they call it strip craniectomy. Uh, that was a very popular surgery uh, and because of the, um, uh, the outcome was not very optimal, uh, reflected on the surgical techniques uh, and probably the, the late uh, time of surgery, uh, this uh, laid the, 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 uh, the uh, uh, favor and uh, Tony to develop more aggressive and, uh, a type of surgery where we have to do craniotomy and craniectomy to correct the deformity. And then Tessier and the French school who were the first started organized uh, uh, what they call it as a cranial vault remodeling procedures that we are doing nowadays. Um, with the uh, uh, evolution of uh, less invasive, minimal invasive that occur in, in some specialities like spine, um, uh, uh, Jimenez and uh, Baron uh, in the in 1999 uh, came with a novel uh, technique using the endoscope uh, to remove the in the suture and they're going back to uh, strip craniectomies and they published their initial series uh, by that time it did not uh, find a lot of acceptance by the pediatric neurosurgeons um, and, and, and and this procedure is not uh, only resecting the the uh, the sutures you have to apply a uh, helmet, a uh, dynamic helmet, that's mean you have to be adjusted every month. And this is very important to get a uh, good outcome. Um, the uh, Luritzin uh, from the facial maxillary uh, experience with the distraction osteogenesis, um, they came with uh, a nice uh, uh, device. Uh, it's like a spring where when you do the, the suture resection, they, uh, they apply the strings around it to make it separated. So you don't have to put a, a helmet um, and then uh, you remove it after six or six months or so. Now, uh, initially did not really have a good result. You have, and the risk of having an infection, a complication from the implants, and you have to have another surgery. Uh, besides it was a metal, even now they came with absorbable device, did not find uh, uh, really a lot of acceptance by the uh, neurosurgeon. Now, we go back in important terminology that we'd like to, to uh, go over it. And uh, the way you classify current synestosis into the classic congenital one, or call it primary or secondary, uh, or need to acquire we, we classify again uh, the morphology, is it single or multiple suture? And then we, we classify on, into uh, genetics. And the genetics is it's coming very strongly uh, in, over the last 
uh, 10 years in recurrent synestosis uh, to know if this is syndromic or non-syndromic. Um, let's eliminate the secondary recurrent synestosis very quickly. In these cases, the hallmark is that the suture biologically is normal. It's not abnormal, okay? And uh, all this uh, has some changes that there is some external forces or internal forces has uh, remodeled the skull into an abnormal shape. Microcephaly is one of the uh, commonest referral from pediatrician um, that we see. And they refer the, ch the child as a case of current synestosis. When you see the child, you look at the child, his, his head is symmetrical and small, okay? It's not deformed. So if, when you try to feel the sutures and the, and the fontanelle, they are very small and even difficult. You do see the scan, you'll find the suture still open. Uh, now, this is uh, uh, microcephalic. Uh, this is not an indication for surgery uh, at all. There is a, a loss of the underlying brain uh, uh, force that uh, enlarges the head. Uh, metabolic bone disease, I've seen very, very few cases. Usually, they don't come to us because the other metabolic abnormality will show up early to the uh, pediatrician. We've talked about the iatrogenic, and uh, the indication is very uh, uh, small for those cases. And then we'll talk about the positional blagiocephaly, um, which is very interesting. Um, uh, I don't know anybody here uh, is uh, older than me when he see the nursery uh, uh, before in the uh, early 90s and even the 80s. They used to nurse the babies after birth prone. So, and uh, because of the increased sudden infant death in nursery, so the, the, the uh, American Academy of Pediatrics uh, uh, came with, uh, with an important uh, statement to change the position into a supine. So from that period, uh, while in, in my training, uh, we've operated on a lot of uh, moderate and severe, what's called lambdoid uh, synestosis. And it was actually positional uh, uh, deformity. So because of the number has increased significantly with uh, the so-called um, uh, posterior plagiocephaly, cranial synestosis. So that was not a cranial synestosis, that was deform deformity from the position. And it's very clear, you can see, you can diagnose it very early, usually, and you can see the child with the frontal part here, there's a frontal bossing here, and, and the, in the same side, there's flattening here. And uh, one of the differential diagnoses that you really have to make sure is the unicronal uh, synostosis. But if you look at the, the child from the top, you see the prominence here, and then flatonics are ipsilateral, okay? And the ear is pushed forward, okay? While in cranostenostosis, you will have a depression here. There is a contralateral uh, bossing uh, to, the, to the depression, but you always look at the ear. The ear is not coming toward the uh, prominence is the other way around, okay? It's away from the, uh, in, in, the in the other side, it's usually uh, normal or even less than that, okay? So the ear position, it will help you a lot. And um, uh, in some cases where you, uh, you are not sure, you have to do some imaging uh, and complete your uh, diagnosis. But most likely the diagnosis usually uh, made um, uh, clinically. Now, when you talk about now the primary current synestosis, um, we like to divide it into a single uh, sutures or uh, multiple or uh, uh, sutures. Single sutures is very classic, as you can see, and every suture that close give you a very characteristic head shape. If the metabolic, metabolic, I mean, metabolic uh, fuse here, it will give you a triangular forehead. It's a, it's a, it's a very classic, uh, and you can diagnose it. The sagittal close give you a scapocephaly, whereas the AP uh, uh, dimension is longer than, than the lateral, and the unilateral uh, plagiocephaly is unilateral and can be uh, bilateral and give you a flattening of the uh, forehead. And the lambdoid, usually, as you can see, there is plagiocephaly posteriorly. And this is a very uh, classic presentation. If you see the child, usually you get your diagnosis immediately by inspection. Now, um, you have to know that single sutures, uh, current synostosis is the commonest, by far it's up to 80%. Uh, some of the classification they used to call uh, non-syndromic uh, that includes all the single sutures. This is not correct, okay? Why? Because there are some isolated uh, coronal sutures, uh, synostosis, either unilateral or bicoronal. They, they are involved in the uh, uh, genetics or the uh, syndromic part, especially uh, Monique syndrome, 17% of unilateral cranial that we used to call 
single suture. So you have to be careful when you uh, mention the syndromic or non-syndromic. Also, the bicoronal suture, up to 38% of the amenic, they have um, uh, uh, bicoronal cystosis. Okay, so single sutures, uh, especially uh, coronal, it doesn't mean that it's not, not, not syndromic. Now we go back to the, uh, the, the other group, which is the syndromic um, uh, current synestosis. And now you will, you will find some time the terminology given for them as uh, FGFR, which is the fibroblast growth factor receptor, which is the, uh, the, uh, the classic 100% in, in uh, uh, gene identification of those, of, those, of those groups. And nowadays, this, is, this paper is old, I put you the, uh, the, the paper here in 93, and it was a good paper, which was one of the landmark paper for the uh, syndromic cranestinostosis here. Um, there was a long list, an even longer list than this uh, syndromic, but the commonest one, Eper syndrome, and this is the gene involved here, 100% uh, uh, penetrance, and it's autodomal uh, uh, dominant. And there are some comments you can see here. The second type uh, will be chromosome, and the third type, uh, uh, the, the fiber. At least in my experience, this is the, the classic three syndrome that uh, you see. Although this is autosomal dominant, up to 50%, uh, you have some sort of mutation and they can develop as a uh, uh, first time. Why uh, syndromic are important? Because in your evaluation, you don't, you don't have to watch it and examine only the head. You have to do a craniofacial assessment and proper physical examination. You have to examine for the eye, for the ears, and hearing, respiratory, uh, and musculoskeletal and extremities, uh, genital urinary, urinary tract uh, abnormality they have, neurological, neurological problems, and some development, cardiovascular, and et cetera. So those patients, they have a lot of systemic uh, problem, and usually they are involved with, uh, in the multidisciplinary uh, group. Um, the diagnosis can be done in utero. Uh, in some cases, you have a, a, a very good uh, technician who come with an ultrasound report that this child has a, a few sutures. Um, now, and it can give you at least a, a single suture, sometimes give you multiple sutures with hydrocephalus and some other abnormality. Uh, if there is a significant deformity, it will be very obvious in, in the ultrasound. And then there's always a question, what to do next? You, uh, and you, you have to do genetic analysis, you have to really uh, go for counseling, you have to meet for the parent, and the mother has to decide whether she want to continue the, the pregnancy or she can terminate uh, the, the, uh, the pregnancy. Um, um, history is, is, is usually important because you really want to know if there is family history and you don't have to ask for only the, the first degree, go up to a third degree and ask for any similar uh, condition. An examination beside the head and fontanelle and uh, deformity in the skull. You really have to check uh, and examine the eye if it's protected or not by the eyelids or not. Um, ask the, uh, the nurses if the patient is still how, how is he sleep, does he uh, have irritability, does he have apnea. Uh, look at the uh, nasal breath of the, of the child. Some of them, they have coronal atresia, they have difficulty uh, breathing, they have a strider. Um, also examine extremities for uh, uh, polysyndactyly, which is uh, uh, one of the uh, common syndromic and, and effort. Uh, you check also the extremities and, and you have to do a systemic uh, um, uh, examination for ultrasound of the uh, abdomen, uh, echocardiogram, et cetera. Um, what are the images uh, really do? Now, in the past, the skull X-ray used to be done. Uh, the yield of a skull X-ray usually, at least in the, in the beginning of the diagnosis, is really uh, insignificant. And it has uh, unnecessary radiation for, for the baby. So uh, most of us would not be recommending skull X-rays. Uh, CD scan is the classic uh, 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 radiological testing that we've done. And it's usually done with 3D reconstruction. It can give you a 3D uh, uh, show of the, not only of the cranium, also of the, of the face. Uh, MRI, whenever you have a child with hydrocephalus or evidence of increased ICD, you should go for MRI, look for hydrocephalus, other additional uh, brain anomaly, especially carry malformation. And then you have to order a, lo a, lo a long list of uh, uh, systemic investigation in syndromic one. The MRI is, is really, uh, we don't use, usually routinely do it for, for a single sutures, but for multiple and syndromic, uh, it has to be done routinely. Now, do you do a genetics analysis uh, in, in the places where it's accessible uh, to do genetics? You can do uh, a gene targeting if you are really 
you have the syndrome, let's it look like an FR syndrome, you want to confirm it, you can just do a straightforward gene targeting testing uh, rather than expensing. But if you have a, an abnormal uh, stigma that was systemic and doesn't fit in syndrome, you're not sure, you can do a comprehensive genomic uh, uh, testing for those patients. Uh, the management of cranial stenosis, um, although the, the single suture might be straightforward and can be done with, easily, but the majority, especially the syndromic, it has to go uh, through uh, a, a good uh, consultation with other people. There's a long list of people has to be involved in those patients, craniofacial team, uh, 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 pediatrician, the ENT, ophthalmology, in case of there's any exophthalmos, uh, radiologists, you have to discuss it with them, and the orthodontists, they have to know in, in the future. Uh, psychotherapists later on they will be uh, involved in the management of patient social worker and genetics and the ICU and uh, other specialties. Now you have to remember that uh, in, in some of the cases of cancer and stenosis they have airway issues and airway problems can be up to 100% especially in some sort of syndromes and they have uh, a long list of uh, problems um, they have reduced nasopharyngeal dimension they have small nasopharynx and small pharynx uh, sometimes they have a coronal atresia. Um, uh, the soft palate might be short and uh, thick for them. They cannot really uh, feed and cannot really uh, breathe. Uh, they might have simple things like a large odontoid uh, or adenoid uh, that can be uh, taken care of by the ENT. Uh, the mandible and the maxilla might be uh, uh, small and, and uh, 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 retruded uh, backward. Or they might have some local tracheal abnormalities like the uh, um, um, beside that, uh, they might have uh, a sleep apnea. If it's happened early and in after birth, this is a bad sign, but usually it starts to develop. These develop after two or three, uh, uh, two or three, three years. Um, and uh, the problem of the airway, if it's not solved initially in those patients, they will have a long term complication like repeated respiratory infection, core banality, and it will affect the neurological function and the, and the brain development by chronic hypoxia and hypercapnia. Um, how to manage airway is simple. Some cases require uh, you know, advice uh, by having the child sleep in certain position and so he can sleep comfortably, it's, it's fine. Some cases we have to do elective tracheostomy before uh, doing any surgery or um, any intervention. Some of them, they have some local uh, problems like a, a tongue tie or large uh, tonsils that can be removed. Um, and uh, sometimes they have really a uh, very deformed uh, face and uh, mandible. And some of them, they need very early intervention, which usually not be uh, uh, routinely done here. This is one of the children that we treated here. He has uh, 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 syndromic uh, cranestenostosis, and you can see the eye was protruded here. He has tracheostomy. We spent like uh, two or three hours getting the airway uh, sorted out before we do the surgery. Uh, increasing the current pressure in cranestenostosis is not only in multiple. It can be in single sutures, uh, up to 14%. But the classic being described for multi-sutures multi and syndromic uh, type, you can have uh, 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 high increase in current pressure. It can be diagnosed or detected clinically. Um, and the reason for that, they might have hydrocephalus. It won't be one of the reasons having high intracranial in pressure. Or the, due to the, the cranial cerebral dis, dis, disproportion, you have a small, tight uh, skull and the brain is fighting to expand. Uh, this is one of the reasons. Venous congestion, because of the compression of the sinuses and venous drainage can add on to, into the cranial intracranial pressure. And uh, a chronic uh, 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 hypercapnia can, uh, can, can cause intracranial intracranial pressure. This is the child here with uh, uh, two sutures involved, the coronal and, uh, and the uh, sagittal. And as you can see here, after we start to remove the head, you can see there is, uh, the, this is the skull pieces we removed from him. You can see the inner indentation from chronic pulsation of the brain and try to find its way and expand the head against few suture. Um, increase ICP clinically. I think uh, uh, most of you know how to, uh, uh, um, you know, detect it clinically, a headache in, in older children, irritability, feeding problems, uh, uh, sleeping uh, issues, uh, apnea, uh, and visual problem. Uh, clinically, you have to 
feel the fountain end, usually bulging or can sometimes you will see congested vein and sometimes you know, ophthalmologists will help you to detect uh, uh, if there's any papilledema or optic atrophy. And also in those patients who had a chronic ri rise of slowly ri rising ICP, we didn't have some sort of developmental uh, delay if it's not detected uh, early. And this is one of the uh, children with, the, with, the, with the multiple sutures. And you can see the appointment end is so open here and the brain try to find the space to go through it. And you can see this is the form, the skull of uh, 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 sagittal and crown and metopic uh, cancer stosis. The radiology, it can help you. It can give you hints uh, in if there is any uh, uh, chronic uh, or undetected local uh, increase the current pressure. As you can see, this is the, the skull X-rays. Now you can you can do it. You will see a bit in metal of uh, uh, of the inner skull. Uh, but the CT scan is uh, is more sensitive and superior than X-rays and even MRI in detecting this in small indentation here, as you can see, in the inner uh, uh, table of the skull here. And in, in here you can see a lot of uh, uh, changes. Yeah, you can see here there's some island or flattening, or you can see there is some missing bone uh, locally around the fused uh, uh, sutures. In this case, is the uh, sagittal cystosis. MRI, MRV is very good, and uh, MRI can show you hydrocephalus as well as the CT scan, as I mentioned. But it can show you type one carry malformation, as you can see here. Okay, and we'll talk about the management later on. Some cases um, where you have a clinical scenario increase in intracranial pressure, the imaging is not conclusive, and the child is irritable. Sometimes we have to admit those uh, children for uh, monitoring, intracranial pressure monitoring. You can put a bolt or a subdural um, uh, uh, monitor and monitor them in the ICU for a few days uh, just to find out if there's any spikes of increased ICP, especially at night. Um, the, the third problem is hydrocephalus. Uh, it's not very rare, up to 10 to 40 percent in, in cases. And um, you have to really uh, be careful when you see a dilated ventricle. Is it just a normal variant dilated ventricles or really, or really hydrocephalus? So you have to, uh, because this might affect the management of the, of the child here. And not only hydro, hydrocephalus is, uh, is uh, in common uh, in, in syndromic, especially like a Crohn syndrome and fiber syndrome, you have to look for other causes of hydrocephalus. How do you manage those patients? Uh, do you wait uh, uh, or you, you treat earlier? Now, if you uh, if they are symptomatic from hydrocephalus, obviously you have to treat hydrocephalus. The problem putting a shunt very early is that it might uh, you know decompress the ventricles, decrease the demand of the brain to, to expand. Um, uh, and then if you do cranestosis, there is no much uh, drive to push the bone away. It might not give you a good uh, uh, remodeling of, of the skull. But if you have to do it, you, have, you just have to do it. Uh, you have to try to delay it if there is no symptom, significant symptoms uh, and until after cranestosis decompression. Because some cases, once you decompress the, the small, tight brain and expand, things will get better. And most of them, they will have stable uh, ventricular dilatation uh, throughout. But some of them, they will come back at some point with significant dilated ventricles and you have to do a uh, shunt. So if you have to do a shunt, um, you shunt. But then if you have to do current center associate surgery, uh, most of these shunts usually are converted to, to, into EBD. And then uh, after uh, one week from uh, surgery, you can put it back in uh, for those babies. Care malformation, we've talked briefly about it. This is uh, uh, common in multi sutures and uh, syndromic uh, uh, part. And, and why it's happening is, especially in posterior type, current uh, sinusosis, the lambdoid and posterior uh, sagittal, it makes the posterior part and the posterior fossa very small for them. And it will compress the brain, compress the posterior fossa down, and it can cause uh, the, the, the abnormality due to crowding. You can see this, uh, this is one of the uh, early child that treated a uh, long time ago. He had carry here, he had mild hydrocephalus, but it was not so clinically. We did a, a, a multi uh, uh, um, social reconstruction for them. It looks much better. The carry persisted. It got better for many, many years, but then he came back, although has no hydrocephalus here, you can see the ventricles look good, and then he has sanguinely here. So they can, they can come back, you have to watch him and carefully. You don't have to do decompression very early for uh, the uh, carrier malformation if there is no symptoms. So we treat hydro and treat current sources and leave the carrier at the end. Later on, if it develops like this child with 
So you might let me go back and you do the standard posterior fossa decompression for Chiari. Eye problems, uh, in, uh, this is one of the commonest complaints by the parents, especially for coronal synostosis. Uh, sometimes they have hypo or hypertotalism, especially with the anterior uh, problem here, like uh, this child here. Um, proptosis, uh, like this child here, it can, it can develop. Uh, the children sometimes they have problems sleeping. They are asleep and they are opening their eyes. So uh, it's uh, very annoying for them, the parents. Uh, and besides exposure of the uh, eye, uh, put them at high risk of uh, keratopathy and corneal alterations, and even, even will, will become blind if they're not uh, well uh, cared for the uh, opened eye. So this, this is one of the problems that the ophthalmology and mutation delivery will come in very early. They can do a simple procedure like uh, lateral uh, tarsography, or you might um, uh, you know, uh, do the surgery, especially for the uh, uh, orbital bar advancement early to let the uh, upper lid fall a little bit to cover the exposed uh, eye. And sometimes this is not enough, so we have, we have to go early for mid-phase uh, procedure. So this is one of the big problems there. And uh, terminology, uh, exophthalmos and uh, uh, exorbitism sometimes come in, 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 in MCQs. Uh, and uh, ex uh, exorbitism, it means eye protrusion with abnormal bony orbital anatomy, which is the same case for this one. While exothalamus, the bone already normal, but the eye for some reason is pushed forward uh, due to additional um, uh, tissues. Um, other problems like feeding, uh, it can be a really, really problem in, in, in those children with the facial anomalies, uh, intraoral problem, uh, head plays of the maxilla and heart palate problem, they have cleft palate, they have occlusion problem. This is the CT scan of the patient that we treated uh, many years ago. And he, look at the maxilla here, it's very small and little uh, retruded uh, down. So he has problem in the occlusion and showing and feeding. And this is one of the problems that uh, usually address later on in life. Some of them require uh, NG feeding and even gastrostomy if they have severe uh, um, uh, an anomaly in the face. Uh, neuropathy is not very common. The only problem is hearing up to 14% can be uh, uh, decreased or uh, they can have a problem. And this is one of the uh, early investigation uh, for cranestinostosis, especially multi sutures and syndromic uh, types, uh, other kind of nerve involvement other than the optic nerve due to papilledema or optic atrophy. Uh, rarely they can develop uh, anosmia or trigeminal involvement or even facial uh, palsy. So, when we go to uh, 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 considering uh, our um, consultation, we tell the family about this one. You really have to uh, uh, explain to the parents uh, the condition um, and then uh, explore options. Uh, most of the parents, they don't like to hear uh, the first line that, okay, we're gonna have surgery. So you really have to explain and explain and explain and then uh, um, uh, uh, they might have to come back for another time to uh, discuss the type of surgery. Some of them believe that the surgery is cosmetic only. This is not true in most of the cases, especially the syndromic. This is not. This is a very crucial and essential part of the management and the function of the child. Uh, so, in some cases, we, we don't operate. I remember a few cases with a very mild metopic sutures. The only problem is see the small ridge here. The child looks fine, neurologically okay. There's no problem. You can do CT scan. Yes, the CT scan shows you there's a fused um, metopic suture. There's a small ridge in here. It's not bothering him. So that's fine. Some of them will not require surgery and you follow them, then they do very well. In some cases with uh, sagittal uh, synostosis, especially partial, uh, although the head looks a bit longer, but the, the parent, they're happy with the shape of the head. The child doing very well, had a good normal development. So again, this is one of the cases that really surgery is not really going to add much uh, uh, apart from mild cosmosis. The same goes for the unilateral uh, or even bilateral coronal synostosis with uh, mild uh, deformity. So there are some parts that we don't really operate in those patients. Of course, the positional deformity or, or plagocephaly uh, usually are managed non-surgically. However, there are severe form and uh, some of them require cosmetic uh, 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 surgical uh, remodeling. The positional, as you can see, it's very early, usually detected. Uh, the, the, they have to educate the patient about the position preference for the, for the child, uh, like change the position of sleeping. They might have to change the bed. 
little bit so the child have to sleep on the other side more, you have to put him some toys, some lights, so he can distract him to look in that, in that direction. There are a lot of tricks to do this. Uh, helmet therapy, uh, we have, you know, helmet therapy is not like we have here, and I haven't seen any uh, uh, places in the kingdom do a proper helmet uh, therapy, which is a dynamic. Helmet therapy is an active. You need to, uh, you need to measure, this, measure it and readjust it every month. You have to apply some active pressure on an area which is protruded and do passive pressure or no pressure on the depressed one. Let's try to remodel uh, the skull gradually. And usually, if you want to do it, you do it between five or six months of life. And after eight months or nine months, usually has no indication because it takes like six months maximum to see the, the, the effect. And if, if you're going to really do it, you have to really make sure that the parent understands it's very important and they have to, to make a, you know, a strong efforts uh, uh, with the child to keep it on because it has to be 24-7 there, okay? And uh, it's not like a helmet that you have to buy it from Toys and Us, apply it, and that's it. No, this is not really a helmet. They, they have to come for regular adjustment every time, and uh, uh, they might have to change it uh, as the child grows. Um, so surgery, uh, obviously surgery is indicated uh, if there's evidence of increased uh, uh, kind pressure, for sure. This is one of the classic indications, severe deformity, um, uh, or progressive uh, uh, skull deformity. This is another indication. Uh, and also if there's any progressive uh, facial deformity or eye uh, uh, danger uh, problem, then you have to do the, the surgery. The important or the goal of surgery here is not just a, just a correction of the deformity here. You need to decompress the, uh, the intracranial structure, uh, make a space for the brain for future development, and, uh, and uh, also you need to prevent uh, treat uh, functional problems uh, uh, that the child have, and not only the head, also the function of the face and, and occlusion, etc. Um, you, uh, you know, you have to optimize the, the, the whole condition for, for the brain. Um, uh, some of them uh, believe that uh, doing early surgery it might has, has an impact on the cognitive function of the child. There are many studies that have supported this, and some studies did not find significant difference, but may, most of them, they find even single sutures, the, the cognitive function, the IQ, the, uh, uh, the, 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 the school uh, um, performance you know, of a child with current kind of sutures is much better if you have done surgery uh, earlier uh, than later. Um, when you want to not do the surgery or maybe postpone it if the child is so severely sick and he's not even uh, fit for general anesthesia, you want to hold on to that a little bit more. And if the child has a significant more uh, anomaly in the heart and, and there's issues about the life expectancy, you might not really have to do the surgery. And we have examples uh, in, 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 in those cases. And usually the deformity is so severe in those children with a very small head and uh, bulging eyes and, and, and they have, uh, they have tracheostomy, they have difficulty breathing. Uh, of course, microcephaly, we mentioned about this, it's not an, an indication for surgery. And in, even uh, uh, position of microcephaly, this is not, not uh, a deformity that you want to do that, uh, except the severe form, and this is totally different. Time of surgery is, uh, is important. Uh, the, the, when you want to do the surgery, uh, some of the cases that you'll see, the, they, can, they can come within one week uh, from birth. And this is not a, and it can be obvious sometimes. You don't have to re, re, do the operation now. Most of us would like to wait a little bit uh, more. Um, uh, for the, the cranial bone surgery, this is a neurosurgical part, uh, remodeling, uh, usually delayed between uh, three to nine, uh, nine months for most of the uh, sutures. Um, with the minimal invasive uh, or endoscopic uh, single suture uh, uh, section, uh, though it can be done for uh, sagittal, can be done for metabolic, can be done for um, coronal. Uh, this, this surgery is usually done a bit much earlier. It can be done within two to four months time because you want to do it early. You want to resect the sutures and apply the helmet and you, the brain will help you to remodel uh, uh, the skull. Uh, Mid-phase surgery, our colleague from uh, uh, patient exudary usually we call them earlier 
uh, but most of them they will uh, not do the surgery except in very selected cases they all, would like to wait for five years or even more they want to have a quality of bone uh, maturity they want to avoid damaging the growth center of the facial bones and etc and also the and then the jaw and uh, problem this can be done usually even later on the advantage of doing early, as we mentioned, uh, you want to decrease the secondary effect of the uh, deformity on the brain, allow the skull to expand, the brain can help you out in getting a really nice uh, shape, um, increase the, the, the chance of the uh, re reossification. Now, so the problem if you do early, uh, the bone can fuse, and you might have to do on a second surgery to reopen it and more. Okay, it's one of the problems of, of uh, doing uh, uh, early surgery. Uh, it's also nice when you do it early, the bone is uh, soft, it's easily being cut, and you can even, you can do it with your hand, you can readjust it or with a small bender, and you can reshape in the, uh, the skull, and you can correct it uh, nicely, and it can uh, also psychologically for the parents, when they see that child, he's in his first six months or one year, he's totally changed and his head looks acceptable, they can go in public without any uh, stigma. Disadvantage of uh, doing early surgery, uh, anesthesia, uh, risk of anesthesia and see then the blood loss and etc. And the problem with revision surgery, you have to be careful with that. Um, the, the procedure that we do for uh, uh, reshaving, um, it's usually a total or regional uh, re-expansion re of the uh, uh, skull around the affected sutures. However, I have to tell you that, you know, the, the strip craniectomies procedure, it's coming back with, uh, with adequate, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, adjuvant, uh, you know, help with the helmet. Um, it can be done to any single uh, sutures. And endoscopic uh, uh, suture removal is, is nice, it's a very, it's a sort of minimal invasive and has a good outcome, less blood loss, less uh, hospital stay, less complication, and the outcome even looks roughly comparable to the uh, uh, large surgery, but you have to do it early. You cannot do it later on. Uh, you have to do it with the sutures, it's thin, the bone is thin, and you have to help uh, the helmet, and I've talked about the helmet a lot, and this is a CIT scan uh, uh, or a 3D model showing you the helmet. This is the helmet here, and this is the amount of pressure they're applying posteriorly, and this is what's done for metopic cystosis. Uh, resection and they have forced compression of the top and it let the brain push the bone out here so it give you a nice rounded so so this is what we call by helmet uh, 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 help uh, in the post operative period of those patients of the, those cases to have a successful and good result it's not just the endoscopy endoscopy will, is a, just a tool of removing uh, the sutures you don't want to do uh, endoscopic suture removal and that's it if the child will come back with recurrence it might require surgery and the surgery require uh, um, more uh, remodeling uh, of the skull and there's always a risk of uh, uh, dural uh, uh, laceration um, two years ago this is a very nice meta-analysis about the endoscope because you know i've seen a lot of uh, uh, parents always ask about endoscopy for does it help uh, for, for, for those uh, uh, cases. Some of them, I said, yes. Some of them, I tell them, no, they're older than this. And you have to come with evidence. So this is a good meta-analysis, part one and part two. Uh, for, for the sagittal, actually, the outcome is, uh, is the same compared to the, uh, the classic uh, surgery. The complication rate is almost the same. It's the meta-analysis they found. But uh, the only thing attractive was the less OR time, less blood loss, and et cetera. And because Mrs. Park was, an outcome was roughly comparable here. Uh, the evidence was not enough to make a conclusion if you do the metabolic uh, uh, and the, uh, and the um, uh, other sutures here. Uh, there is no strong evidence here. Uh, the outcome, uh, they, they wrote a soft statement, but the outcome was much better uh, for other sutures uh, with the classic uh, surgery. Uh, the surgery that we do is the remodeling procedure. I'll show an example of this, either anterior, anterior or posterior, or even total uh, for uh, severe, either single or multiple deformity. Uh, not all the cases, even if you can early with severe deformity, you might not uh, want to do the endoscopic or minimum basic thing. For recurrent uh, cases, uh, if you want to remove a, a lot of uh, bone and re reconstruct the, the skull, this is the way to go. And also, it gives you a better correction. Uh, it can be uh, very early. You can see it next day or 
as you close the skin. And I'll show you an example for this. Uh, preparation of the patient is very crucial. Uh, always remember, because the, the family will come after three months, six months, and will tell you, okay, well, you ask him how is the child, how he looks, is he looks better? And the mother saying, well, mm, yeah, okay, not, not great. But if you show them the picture before and after, you say, oh my God, that was really big, significant. So always ask the parent to take a photograph for their child before surgery and after the surgery and always remind them to do that for you. And they can show you the picture. You can do that after getting your, your uh, permission that you do surgery, take the photography intraoperative or before surgery and keep it in your um, uh, data for these cases. Um, you have to cross match uh, 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 blood for those patients. And remember that you have to go to the ICU for one or two days after surgery. Antibiotic is, is very important. Sometimes you get dexamethasone because of the swelling of the face around the eyes, and, and sometimes the swelling goes down, down all the way to the neck. Um, the anesthetist usually put a good uh, uh, IV cannulas or even center line in those patients uh, for the catheter arterial line. And um, um, I don't usually uh, shave, uh, as you can see from this picture here, I can really mark my zigzag incision without shaving and it makes a big difference psychologically for the child and for the parent as well. And uh, you know, in my practice and supported by many evidence, the infection rate is not that significant that if you shave or not to shave. So it's, uh, it's an option for the surgeon to do that. Uh, you have to make sure to cover the eyes very well, especially a child with a protruded eye. You have to either do temporary uh, lateral thoracotomy or put a bandage and make sure the fluid or the uh, aseptic solution doesn't go to the, to the eye to cause uh, keratitis uh, or uh, corneal laceration. Um, uh, of course, temperature is very important during surgery and careful uh, positioning based on your preference or and how you feel comfortable with the anesthetic uh, as well. Basic principles, do as much as you do, as big as you do. Don't limit yourself with small incision and necessary construction, okay? If you open, just open, it's, it's the same. Um, you know, in doing surgery, sometimes the current, the current facial people or the patient really would like to do some procedure in older children uh, that include uh, the sickness around the sinuses and Etc. Um, unless it's necessary, I would go for that if I'm doing the, the primary surgery, just because of the infection is significantly increased whenever you violate uh, the sinuses with the cranial uh, part. Um, whether you, uh, you use uh, um, titanium or uh, 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 metals, uh, and, and those, it's, it's an option, but in all the children and, and adults, it's not a problem, but in babies, uh, I like not to use the titanium because uh, the skin is very small and they can come for the skin and they can cause some, some pain. You can use uh, sutures or absorber plates if, if it's available. Uh, blood loss is, is a very crucial in, in surgery. So whenever you want to do the surgery, you use a, a needle a cautery to cut the, the skin. You dissect the skin um, uh, uh, um, uh, between the, the loose area the tissue of the skull and the periosteum. You don't have to start and uh, you know uh, peel the periosteum very early. Uh, you wanna, this will cause you a lot of bleeding. So continue. Once you want to reach your orbits, then you have to cut the periosteum and then dissect uh, subperiosteally around the orbit to to the exposure, but uh, not to uh, violate the, the periosteum. This is where you get the blood loss. Besides cutting the bone, um, uh, I always ask the anesthetist, "Do you have the blood in the room before I?" Uh, I go unscrub. I would like to see the blood there. Uh, you have to see it before you go. Sometimes it takes an hour or two. And believe me, those babies uh, have small volumes and they bleed. And sometimes you don't recognize doing surgery when you cut the bone, you cut the skin and do the section that they lost uh, more than 30% of their blood volume and they become high volume. So make sure you communicate very well with the anesthetist and the, uh, the OR personnel about this. Um, bone wax is important and cautery and, uh, and if, if possible, we have a sort of a cell saver that you can re uh, transfuse the blood, but it will, it will be good for them. The incision type, it's a, it's a preference for surgeon. I, I use in my practice to do a classic bicoronal with a single, uh, not zigzag uh, sort of incision. I change my practice with the help of our plastic colleagues when they have really a nice uh, 
uh, uh, skull, uh, you know, hailing with a nice zigzag. And uh, I, I like their uh, technique. So I use most of the patients use the zigzag technique. And especially here, when you go uh, the zigzag, you try to go posteriorly here because this is the hairline is here. So you go posteriorly here and then come back and zigzag. You don't want to go like this. This is wrong because here there's no hair. It's very, very obvious to outline. So always, this, this is a very good start. I always start from here and then continue. Uh, I can do midline for uh, uh, some cases with uh, sagittal synostosis. Um, it, it, it heals very nicely. Uh, so this, this is a, a preference for the, for the surgeon. Uh, how to position your patient, again, this is important. Um, some cases where you want to do a supine position, especially for the anterior part, uh, like metopic and some of the coronal, it's very simple and very easy to do a supine with the incision like this uh, for them. And they usually the head is rested on the horseshoe. Of course, you don't have to clamp the head in a mayfield or something like that. You don't need uh, this. Um, Prone position, uh, if there is uh, work posteriorly, especially lambdoid and uh, posterior part of the sagittal, sagittal uh, sutures, or even sagittal suture only, where most of the problem is posteriorly, you can do it uh, prone. Uh, you have to make, communicate with the anesthetist to fix his uh, tube. I had one uh, patient at least uh, with the extubation during the surgery for some reason and was not fixed. So it was a really uh, uh, an, an action that day because we have to close very quickly and have to turn the child for reintubation and then turn it back and finish the surgery. You don't want to do that. Um, this position, I haven't uh, done it myself. The phoenix is like uh, the, the, the lion, the, you know, when he sit like this, this is a, a phoenix uh, position. And this is a, a, a position it's, uh, it's good if you, if you have uh, uh, to remodel the whole skull. It, uh, technically, it's really good. The head is above uh, the heart a lot, so there's a risk of uh, not only venous bleeding, but uh, embolism. Uh, the tube uh, has to be fixed properly. There is too much hyperextension in the neck. So, uh, you know, patient who has carry maturation or cervical problems, you should avoid not doing that. So uh, a lot of uh, uh, neurosurgeon, um, that I know when I talk about position, none of us uh, feel comfortable doing that position. We just, uh, we feel either supine or um, uh, prone. If you have a posterior one, you can uh, push the, the, the horseshoe more uh, down here and it can push the head up for you. So you can really reach up to the lumboid, even behind the lumboid uh, sutures. Um, I'll just show you an example because uh, uh, I'm sure you want to get into this stage and showing how uh, this surgery being done. This is a child with uh, a very classic uh, uh, scaphocephaly where the CT scan shows there's no sagittal suture here. And this is very classic. This is just to show you the, the, the problem here. And this is the exit CT scan here. You can see this normal ventricles and etc. With sagittal sinusitis, usually you don't see any intracranial abnormalities. And you can see the classic shape of the scaphocephalic AP diameter here. This is a child here with the, the zigzag. This is a surgery was done more than 10 years um, ago. And uh, we, this is after surgery. You can, this is just to tell you again, is the child in a supine position here. And this is the corona suture. This is the metopic, this is the sagittal. And you can see, I, we leave the periosteum is intact here in this case. We don't, we do it later on. Later on, we make a small incision uh, and we remove the periosteum and then we do bare hole, bare hole and then we do strip correctly to remove the, uh, the uh, sagittal suture. Because the child presented late, so doing sutrectomy is not enough. So we really have to do additional uh, surgery where we have to do the uh, uh, barrel stoving uh, osteotomies laterally all the way down. And then you can do some uh, bending of the skull here. And then you can help with the bone that you removed and you can uh, help these bones to stay uh, out and give you a more lateral uh, dimensional uh, correction and can be fixed with sutures or absorber plates. Um, this is the child before surgery here. This is the CT scan. This is the next day or later on after a few days. You can see there is normal looking CT scan and it's immediate after after the closing the head. You can see the rapid de decrease of the AP diameter uh, in these cases. So this is a corrected surgery. You can see very early result. Uh, another case uh, was done uh, recently. The child. He was, uh, now we did the surgery uh, uh, by the time he was uh, more than two years because he has uh, 
some uh, hematological problems with the platelets, so we could not do the surgery and require a platelet transfusion, and he's been delayed. And he's keep, he keep progressing and getting worse and, uh, cosmetic wise. So we did the surgery here. I don't have the preoperative CT scan, but uh, this is the surgery here after removing the bone. And then uh, we, we did the same uh, osteotomy here, expanding more laterally and putting bridges with the bone here. And you can see in the 3D reconstruction here. And I did the quiet one. Well, this is polycyclical cyanostosin. Uh, the same uh, child, uh, postoperative. Um, this is the nose here, and you can see it doesn't show really how AP uh, dimension here, but after we close here, you can see the nice uh, lateral dimension improved. And this is immediate CT scan here and coronal. You can see the big difference between this one and this one here with a good lateral uh, expansion. Uh, coronal cyanostosis is a, it's a, it's a classic, and uh, it's a, the second commonest single suture after a sagittal cyanostosis. And the CT scan is very clearly where you have unilateral or bilateral. Uh, again, uh, surgery through the zigzag by coronal incision here and exposing. If we have unilateral coronal sutures, uh, uh, you can do with only one side correction, you can keep the other side. But sometimes it's so deformed, you really have to open both to really make it all symmetrical. So if it's so deformed and you elevate this one, it will not be very good. So if it's uh, moderate, you can, you, can, you can get away with only unilateral um, uh, because you have to remove the frontal bone on this side, as you can see here, and you have to cut the uh, orbital bar or make a, 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 like a green stick fracture here and cut it here and then push it forward. And sometimes you have to remove it and to reposition it and fix it again. And this is after fixing the, uh, the skull. And uh, here, the 3D reconstruction after surgery it looks very good, unilateral. Uh, type and uh, this is before surgery. Look at the diversion here, and there's you know, I can say there's some still asymmetry, but it looks much better. Um, overall, bicoronal stenostosis it can happen. This is a child with uh, bicoronal stenostosis with a very flat AP uh, diameter, as you can see here. This is so flat in here, so um, I don't know why uh, the resident shaved uh, or the assistant for me, but usually I don't uh, shave these cases. That was uh, I was not happy with that. Um, and this is uh, done with the classic uh, black hole incision here. And then uh, you see the pericranium, uh, we leave it alone and then we uh, uh, dissect to see the sutures and do the surgery. Here, this is our uh, frontal uh, craniotomy and the orbital bar is done. And then we do the uh, uh, advancement here doing osteotomy. And here, this is the posterior cut of the um, sort of orbital ridge in both sides. And then you have to cut the the, the, the uh, orbital uh, here, uh, the, the sutures, and then you have to go to the uh, uh, frontal nasal suture to dis the disconnect here, and you take the orbital part completely, and then you have to remodel it and put the uh, plate from inside, absorbable, to keep it there so it doesn't keep going back and forth, and then you go back, uh, fix it laterally here after you adjust it uh, in both sides with sutures or with uh, plates. The child was old uh, enough, and we used the uh, titanium uh, uh, plate and suture, but uh, she came back two years, and I had to remove one of her plates, which was causing me pain uh, here. So I have to mention to you that, uh, that this is one of the problems. After surgery, here looks nice, and you can see the good advancement of the forehead. And then I see this child uh, uh, now. She's, mashallah, she's uh, 16 or 17. I saw her many times. Um, a bit of, uh, you know, this is one just quick uh, diagram just to show you the frontal orbital advancement, what we mean, this is frontal orbital bone after you remove it. So you can do multiple uh, uh, green stick here to make it uh, uh, remodel so you can apply it again. And sometimes you can, uh, it can fracture, that's fine. You can fix it again with, with the plate and, and fix it again. So this is the, recon the construct that you can see, the orbital uh, bone. Uh, when we remove it, usually we don't put it the same. Usually one side will be different and rotated. So very rarely the, the, orbit, the, the front of the bone will be put in the same position. Usually we take it out, the right will become left, left can be right, and then we will rotate, we trim, we cut, we make it looks, uh, uh, looks better. And for the frontal here, I, we have to really find the, 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 boss, the front and the bossing. Usually one here, one there. So we try to bring it all together so it can give you the classic front and bossing uh, that you see in normal people. Um, the topic is uh, the surgery is not much different than the uh, coronal cyanostosis with, uh, and you can see this is 3D reconstruction. There is a fused um, topic. You can see the, the, the triangular forehead uh, of the trigonocephaly uh, 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 here. This child was done um, probably in, in 2005. Um, 
and uh, they put a zigzag incision here for him. He has a metodic. Uh, the family didn't like the very narrow forehead. It was mainly of uh, cosmetic uh, issues. And this is the bicoronal uh, incision. And you can see the metodic uh, suture here. This is the bar after we remove it. It's so triangular, so we have to break it for him. Use a drill here and drill a little bit here. Then you green stick it. And then uh, if it stay fine, OK. If not, you, you put a plate from inside to keep it so it doesn't come back uh, again. Um, and this is after uh, the, uh, the, the reconstruction for him. The child uh, had uh, uh, so much uh, triangular, so we really have to go back a little bit and do some osteotomies and, and push the, the bone from this into this one to give him a nice uh, forehead. Um, this is before surgery and after surgery, you can see and you can notice the, the, the early effect of the uh, reconstruction. I see the scan, I can see this is a very uh, classic uh, metopic synestosis, uh, but this is after correction, it looks uh, very normal. Um, Sometimes lambdoid alone, uh, rarely you will, feel, you will see lambdoid synestosis. If it happens, usually it progresses into a severe and usually involves the surrounding, mainly the posterior uh, uh, sagittal uh, uh, sutures. So this is a child uh, operated uh, recently. Uh, six month old girl, she, she, she's normally, normally developing well. Uh, she has just a very small posterior part of, of the head. The front is a bit uh, rounded for her. Uh, there is some congested veins, I can tell you, but the front one is, is uh, soft for her. And uh, whenever you see somebody with lambdoid, bi bilateral, and uh, with sagittal, it's a multiple suture. You think of hydrocephalus, you think of increased intracranial pressure. She had normal eye uh, uh, optic disc and the uh, development was good. And she has, you know, hydro, you know, not hydro, I would say li large ventricles. You know, most of us will go ahead and, and put a TV shunt in, in those children. But uh, and actually one of my colleagues who uh, looked after my, uh, this child before me, he put an EVD and um, he did not find any evidence of clinical intercranial pressure until he took it out later on after one week. This is a CT scan shows the crowdedness of the posterior fossa with the lambdoid. So most of them, they have caramel formation. There's a local effect of increasing the current pressure. You can, you can see there's a lot of uh, bone island here. And this is the MRI of the same child. Look at the karyotype one one formation here. Okay? And it's very shallow posterior fossa. So what do you do? You shunt them, you do the carry, you do the current center source. As I told you, the hydrocephalus is not the driving or the, not the primary problem of her increasing the current pressure. You leave the, the, the ventricle, don't shunt them, just focus on the current stenostosis, and later on follow the hydrocephalus and the caramel formation. This is what we did for the, for the patient. This is uh, done at the university. This is, I think, believe, Kai Farmawi, and this is the Rina putting her hand in the wound. I don't like this, but it's okay. This is during the picture here. This is a child in prone position. This is the posterior part here of the occiput after doing, uh, removing the, uh, the sagittal suture here and opening the, the bone. Uh, more uh, laterally to give her more space. And we put some bone here posteriorly. We took out the lambdoid social all the back. And you can see here in the 3D reconstruction here, uh, this is what we did for her. You know, if you go posteriorly here, you will find the, the sinus and the uh, transverse sinus. This is dangerous if you wanna really go there. And I would not advise anybody to go there because it's very congested sinus. There is high risk of uh, bleeding. If it happens, it's gonna be very uh, difficult to, to stop sometime. And I would not go for the caramel formation early. Uh, you can see here there's some local uh, defects in the suboccipital bone here. Um, you have to be careful if you want to do early decompression in those children. So uh, last time I saw her two weeks ago in the clinic, she's uh, doing well. And again, her front line is soft and sunken. It's not, there's no issue of increased uh, ICP. This is a case of multiple sutures. They can, can, they can, can present in a very deformed uh, head, this child with a severe lambdoid. Uh, he has a coronal and, and sagittal here. This is a seed scan with 3D reconstruction. You can see it has a coronal on the right side here. Um, the sagittal is, is involved, the lambdoid is, is involved. The child, when he came, he was irritable. Uh, he has stapel edema, so one of the cases that we'd like to do early. And this, this is the surgery. We did as much as we can because we want to correct posteriorly as well as anterior here. So do a large uh, exposure, expose frontal and temporal, parietal, and posteriorly as well. Again, we like to keep the periosteum uh, in the dissection and do it later on. And this is, this is only a dura here. We removed all the bone because we really have to do a total uh, head uh, reconstruction for, for the child. I still see him because I know his uh, father 
uh, well. And so he's uh, now, he's almost uh, 16 or 17 years old. Uh, the last time I saw him was more than 12 years ago. And we did seal scan for him that time. So very good bone healing. Um, and then this is a nice uh, axial seal scan. You can see good rounded uh, skulls, uh, very satisfactory cosmetic as well as functional outcome, which is very important. Um, uh, most of the cases that you will do, because you're expanding the head, you will have a lot of spaces of the bone. You don't know what to do. It's just it's the bone, you cannot, you cannot cover it. So you leave it alone. You don't have to cover it. No need for current for, 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 uh, for uh, um, uh, acrylic uh, uh, repair and, and very early. You should not, you should not do that, actually. You just leave it alone. Most of them, it will re and it will fill. And if there is any island developed after five years, then you have to see if it's worth going, doing again and close that defects with uh, bone taken from, for example, the, the electrics, or you can do acrylic crystals. So uh, you have to reassure the, 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 the mother, to show me the mother, because she will tell you uh, there's defects here and there. Eventually, most of them they will, uh, they will uh, re -ossify. The syndromic is, is a problem uh, always. The mortality is very high, up to 85%, because not only the surgery, the around the surgery uh, itself, including airway and et cetera. Um, the, the, the timing and the consequence for procedure, because in the syndromic uh, cases, you have your colleague from patient auxiliary, they have their own concern, uh, swallowing, breathing, um, uh, cosmetic uh, and effect, and sometimes you have to do the surgery early. Uh, in, in one stage or two stages, so you really have to communicate with them. Usually, we would like to do our cranial part within uh, not less than uh, three and six months, we wait a bit more. Um, if they have some extremity issues, usually they wait until one or two years. Uh, if they have mid phase uh, 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 retrusion, usually it's, it's valuable. Some of them they would like to go early, and they have now a lot of uh, technical uh, thing, uh, uh, surgical technique they can. Do it with us and with a good result with some sort of high, uh, some higher complication rate like infection and uh, uh, deformity. Um, the the um, uh, cranial valve remodeling, uh, especially the anterior or even posterior uh, uh, surgery, um, some uh, some some syndromic one uh, they can uh, uh, be helped with uh, some sort of uh, distraction. I have. Uh, two cases that uh, I did with uh, my colleagues in, in a patient with syndromic uh, cranial There was no issue um, of uh, uh, increasing the current pressure. The cosmetic were not too bad, but this one, this has helped them to uh, advance the, the forehead uh, uh, better for the, uh, and to prepare for the maxillary uh, correction. Um, so our colleagues, we don't do this operation as a nursery, but you really have to know the names because they will talk to you and you should know what, what the meaning of lipo 3 or lipo 1 and monoblock uh, and uh, monoblock uh, front orbital uh, advancement uh, with lipo distraction, what are the distraction, what, the, what is the use of it, uh, facial pie partition, I'll show you some picture. But this, this is not a surgery that we do, but we will get into uh, a discussion always uh, for, with our colleague from facial user issues, know all this. For syndromic, the commonest one in my practice is uh, apert followed by crossing. It's nearly like uh, uh, 51 to 49 uh, between them. It's, uh, and this is the child I treated in, uh, in King Faisal in 2002. He came uh, from the south. He's uh, significantly with function, poor function. He was uh, on a ventilator. Um, we had to uh, do the surgery because of the multiple suture cranial as you can see here. And he has a very classic uh, uh, picture here. In extremity, if you see, this is a very classic upper syndrome. Uh, this is the intraoperative for, for them after a, a, a frontal decompression and orbital advancement for him. Um, I still see him now, he's in, uh, in university, mashallah, and he mentally he's a very smart uh, person. She is uh, our colleague from plastic surgery, Dr. Uh, Abdarroop and the King Faisal. He did a very good job, and he can write, he's writing even better than mine. It's really very good, very bright job. Uh, Acrosin syndrome, this is your second uh, syndromic cranosynostosis. Uh, this is a child uh, we saw earlier. Uh, this is where I used to do the bicronal one line. Uh, that, no, I don't do it anymore. And this is a very large uh, protrusion here. You can see the, the skull is fused here. 
and there is some indentation for chronic intracranial pressure. The brain start to push here. Now we have to be careful when we do the surgery because here, not only the dura, the sinus is stretched here, so you really have to be careful when you decompress the bone uh, around the uh, sinus here. This is before surgery here, which is very uh, shallow and flattened uh, 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 anterior part of the head. This is during surgery. After decompression, the amount of bone we have to remove, orbital bark, and front and some of the parietal and then reconstruction here. This is him after surgery, he did very well, his head looks better. After you do a remodeling, the brain will help you a lot to remodel very quickly and really very promising. One of the cases that really I like after surgery to see a very significant improvement here. This is after many years and this is him. I told you about the island of the bone, always you can see small island, usually not significant here. This child, he's sitting in a chair with the facial delivery at the university with Dr. Ahmed Yamani, he's uh, now he's for the problem because we held him a lot with the eyes. He can close his eyes now. Uh, at that time, he had some problem. Now, the problem now is the very uh, shallow maxilla that he's going for uh, the second stage of the surgery. Uh, how do you fix the osteotomies? I mentioned very briefly, metallic absorbable. The problem with uh, absorbable plate and screws, uh, not really available all the time. It's very expensive, but really they're very good and, and you get absorbed after one year and really give you a firm fixation because children, they move and they hit their head a little bit and they can, they can come back again with all the constructs being disrupted because of the small uh, bang on the, on the head. You don't wanna see that. But again, if you put the rigid one, be careful because uh, some of them need to be removed and they can uh, 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 injure the skin or even the dura. Post-operative care, we mentioned uh, briefly about the pre-operative care. Post-operative care, even very important. Those patients, they have difficult airway sometimes. They have to be uh, transferred, intubated to the ICU, stay for one to two, two days, uh, monitor the blood loss, temperature, and vitals, etc. cetera. Um, reassure the, everybody about the edema. All the children, they will have edema in the face, eyes. They cannot open their eyes. It's very annoying for the, for the mother. She will tell you uh, that my child is having problems, always crying. So you just have to reassure them, give a uh, steroid sometime. And give time sometimes, you get a small dose of Lasix, it, will, it, it, might, it might help, but to have to uh, um, uh, reassure them. And uh, try to get imaging after, after uh, uh, 24 hour, usually I get to see the scan uh, just at the baseline and look if there's any uh, post-operative uh, complication like hydro, subdural, etc. Um, fever is one of the uh, common problem and usually because of blood product uh, reaction with the dura and it can be annoying everybody running uh, uh, getting aseptic uh, you know blood work and all, like, blood culture etc and most of them they, they come back negative and uh, usually it's just a part of the uh, response um the the uh, how you follow those patients, as like in most of the patients regularly here, you don't have to scan them from time to time. Usually at one year, I do a CT scan with 3D reconstruction, it's baseline, just to compare the, the, the facial or the cosmetic with the inside uh, correction. Uh, if there's any hydrocephalus or carry, I would like to uh, do a frequent MRI for them just to uh, follow up the hydro and the, the uh, carry malformation. Uh, usually by the time they're six year old or six years after surgery, I don't see them, they, they go back. Uh, uh, to their life, they go to school, they do, I see them once or, or twice later on, they assure the family and, uh, and, and that's it. And, uh, but the syndromic one, those ones you really, if, even the, if, they, if, they, if they reach the, the, the uh, age of going from pediatric to adult, they have to be either transferred to another facilities to look after adult uh, uh, cases of syndromic or you follow them up uh, all the time. Intraoperative complications. We mentioned about the airway. You have to be careful in the, in the position as well. And uh, if you do supine, you dissect a lot. You know, the, sometimes you move the head a lot in flexion extension. This can loosen the tube. So we're trying to be careful and not to put anything over the uh, face of the child because all exposed. Nobody leaning there. These are simple major. I'm sure nobody's doing that. But this is one of the problems that can uh, give you some sort of uh, alarming from the anesthetic uh, tube. Blood loss, again, we mentioned about blood loss is uh, one of the main problems. It has to be available in the room. Coagulopathy can happen. Uh, sinus injury, if, you, if, if sinus is injured, don't panic. Put your finger on it, just irrigation, and just give it time while you're prepared. Um, uh, if it's small, you can suture. If it's significant, you just apply a small, prepare pericranium and gel, gel foam and apply pressure. In most of the cases, you don't have to worry about that. And it will stop, and then you continue surgery carefully. 
uh, rarely. I've, uh, I've seen people uh, abort doing the surgery, but unless you have a major tear, this is a problem that you have to fix it. And it's going to be uh, depend on the anesthetist and you and how, do, how is the patient stable to carry on or not. Dural tear, it can happen. People uh, during the section, especially at the suture line, you can get dural tear. The majority is very small and you can notice it immediately. You can suture it. The CSF leak chance is very, very small. Some cases where you break, especially the, the in lower part or the front of that section here, when you crack the, the orbital bar, you can tear the dural from below with or without CSF leak and can sometimes it's not noticed. And later on, the child has seen CSF collection repeated there. You aspire to see all of CSF. So what do you do? Well, this is a very difficult case where you have to try non-operative as much as you can. Uh, lumbar puncture can help you to decrease and hopefully the, this uh, uh, will seal, um, seal off. And sometimes a shunt will help. And in some cases, you have to go back. And it's really um, difficult to go back again and look for the tear unless you had some imaging studies showing the tear. Uh, some cases, they, uh, you get uh, what's called like a, a growing a skull fracture. It can happen where the uh, leptomingal sit will, will go through the small defect in the dura, and then the brain will cause problem, and then you have to go back and do a major surgery. So be careful with the dura dissection. Uh, tear is okay. Close it uh, primarily. Uh, usually, you don't have to put a graph in those cases. Avoid uh, dissection. Don't be aggressive. Don't cause contusion or epidural or subdural uh, uh, hemorrhage or any injury. And when you dissect around the eye, you have to be really big careful because when you you need, you're going to pull the, the skull and you're going to dissect the periorbital. So, and sometimes when you have to retract the frontal um, uh, uh, frontal lobe and somebody's retracting the orbit so you can do the osteotomy. So this is the where you injured the orbit. So you have to be very gentle in the retraction. You have to work together with the, with the assistant. So minimize the retraction and, and uh, always stop, relax a little bit, continue until you finish the osteotomy around the uh, orbital ridge and then that will be fine. So these are the important uh, tips uh, of uh, complication and avoidance. Late complications, uh, it can. The worst thing is, is, is to do the surgery and after all, the deformity is the same. This is really bad. Um, and this can happen because of the uh, uh, reossification, re uh, some issues not in, in your hand or some trauma that deformed the, the skull or just a technical thing. Um, uh, in, in case we mentioned that if you have an area of, uh, of uh, uh, um, area of uh, bony island not fused, um, you, you have to wait for five years. When the child is five years of damage, to decide where they want to go and put the uh, 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 methyl or or, or, or uh, bone graft. Um, the, the the problem of uh, 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 screws and hardware we mentioned that, and that's why I'm. Uh, I'm a, a big fan of absorbable plate and screw. I know it's expensive, and many would disagree with me on that, but uh, uh, the, 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 the uh, cosmetic and the complication from it is much, much better uh, than using the titanium. We mentioned about leptomingal cyst, and it's, uh, I've seen only one case, and uh, surgery is okay. You can go back and do the surgery and uh, uh, repair it with, uh, with a good urograft, uh, and then you can reapply the, the bone. It's not a technically very difficult. Late complications uh, can happen, and um, the craniofacial uh, surgical uh, uh, team will uh, get in now, and uh, always they will, uh, uh, you know, need your help because some of the procedure that we do will need to reopen again the bicranial incision. Sometimes you have to do frontal craniotomy. Sometimes to open the the reconstruct that you have done many years ago. So. Uh, this is part of the surgery they do, so they, they need. You know, and don't, I mean, uh, I mean, don't be reluctant to go back uh, doing that. Uh, just go back again, open this, and uh, they, this will help them a lot in, in doing a proper surgery. So sometimes you have to go back for the facial maxillary problem, not for the uh, surgery itself. Always uh, 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 watch for increased ICP. The natural history of cancer sources especially if they have hydro, chiari, um, or chronic ICP after surgery, we, it's not very clear. We don't know what's gonna happen. So those cases, you really have to uh, monitor them uh, carefully, clinically and radiologically. 
Um, we'll talk about reoperation. Reoperation is something that we don't like, but it's up to 7% in most of the series, and maybe slightly higher. And the mortality usually uh, two times uh, uh, higher than the uh, first uh, surgery. Um, this is uh, some of the nomenclature that our colleague you do. I'll just show you some pictures. This is a monoplug osteotomy that you can see. Again, by frontal incision and removing the frontal orbital bar. And uh, the, 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 this is will move with the, with, with the maxilla here, monoblock, we'll move it all in one. Okay, so they, they do or, orbital osteotomy here. So you move the orbit uh, together. By partition, if you go more down, see they are moving on, even the, not only the orbit, the maxilla will move forward. And this can be done in the same time if there is severe deformity and the child is old enough and you wanna do the same uh, thing, the, the child has no increased ICP. So this can be done with the same thing of the page maxillary. Orbital osteotomy for hypertourism is simple, but uh, most of them, they will require the bicron incision, frontal craniotomy, orbital bile uh, advancement, and then the, we will do the osteotomy here to approximate uh, the, the bone as well as lateral osteotomy, so it can mobilize the orbit uh, from uh, laterally to, to medially. Uh, Lefortry, this is one of the surgery that is very common done by our colleagues, Fish and Auxiliary, uh, and sometimes they, really, they don't need you. They do a uh, subsidiary incision here and then uh, submucosal incision, and they can do all the osteotomies uh, without uh, our help. They do it a lot uh, by themselves. Uh, external use of this, this one of our child, he has surgery and, uh, and he's now for the, uh, the hypo uh, uh, maxilla, as you can see here. See, this is very impressive. I, I like our colleagues' work as well. They do a very good job. See the maxilla after, after just a simple distraction uh, with, with time, how it's uh, nearly went back and he needed to do some, some sort of small surgery in the teeth and that's it with, with very, very good results. So these are the cases that require multidisciplinary uh, care and uh, understanding of the whole pathology. Now, what do we do now with COVID-19 uh, with cranioacetosis uh, surgery? You know that the, the virus transmission is, is high for even for babies. There are reports of this. Um, which cases that you will do? Obviously, cases with increased ICP uh, require urgent intervention for the hydrocephalus or for the reconstruction in them. Uh, but overall, we'd like to delay the surgery, especially for single suture as much as we can. We don't know when COVID-19 will be over, but uh, we have to be uh, prepared that we're gonna have some cases coming with the later presentation uh, without increasing NICP, and then we have to, have to deal with it at that, at that time. Uh, if you have to do a child, either he's a COVID-19 positive or uh, you, have to do, you have to apply the, all the precautions for everybody like uh, or each hospital has their own protocol, anesthesia, uh, neurosurgery, and there's a precaution that you have to follow. Uh, obviously, the anesthesia will go in first with their uh, PPE and uh, all the procedures. They will do the intubation. Everybody will be out of the room after 30 minutes. Uh, they finish, you come back in and you do the surgery position. And after that, you go out after you finish everything, let them extubate, and after 30 minutes, you come back. So this is, just the H this is one of the protocols that we follow in, in, in our hospital. Nothing technical in, in, in current anastosis, but because of the, uh, the, the, the uh, erosion generation from drilling, blood, try to avoid too much drilling and the dust going out. Uh, theoretically, this might be one of, uh, you know, the inhalation uh, hazard of uh, uh, virus uh, transmission and avoid irrigation and splashing everybody in, in, in the face. This is very bad. Use bigger suctions and have to be careful in this sense of the procedures. Um, uh, this is the only thing that we have to do different. Um, uh, the the, the uh, science has a very nice statement published uh, this month or early uh, in April uh, with our colleagues and they, 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 they made clearly uh, priorities for patients with cranioacetosis. So which one you really do? So patients with uh, uh, cranioacetosis with evidence of high intercanal pressure from ICP, hydrocephalus, or et cetera, they are labeled as priority three, which is done within one week to four weeks usually, okay? We don't wanna really uh, keep them waiting until it's over, they might have a problem. Other than that, uh, even, with, even with severe deformity, but there's no issue with ICP, we usually uh, reassure the parent and would like them to wait as much as we can until the crisis is over. Uh, and with this, I think uh, I'm gonna conclude the, uh, the talk here about current resources and uh, 
thank you for listening. Thank you, Ahmed, for organizing this uh, uh, webinar sessions, and uh, I'll be happy to receive any questions. Thank you very much, Professor, for this uh, interesting uh, talk and uh, very informative uh, lecture. Uh, we have a couple of questions. Uh, first one from Dr. Hani. Uh, uh, the reason for high ICB in a single suture uh, current sinusosis? Um, this has not uh, been uh, explained very well. Uh, we've seen that we, most of these uh, increased ICP uh, studies being done by uh, previous report where they used uh, uh, intracranial monitoring for even for single sutures. And they found uh, in those cases, uh, the ICP is higher, especially at night, for cases with single sutures, uh, with a cytal, metopic, or, 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 or uh, corona. And this is done by a proper ICP measurement. Now, we don't do it routinely in our practice, but at least, we, this is when we come into discussion with the parent, and uh, you have to tell them, okay, uh, of course, this is uh, one of the surgery for single suture is cosmetic, but there is a small chance, up to 10, 15 percent, that the child might have a evidence of, of increased ICP. Why this happening? We don't know, but we believe that the deformity might have caused at least locally. And uh, I showed CT scan where there's some um, uh, some. Uh, 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 lesions or island around the uh, in, uh, fused uh, sutures where you can see very clearly the child might not have clinical evidence of ICP, no epilodema, but there is uh, MRI evidence of chronic uh, uh, of I ICP. So this is the thing. Why it's happening? I think uh, it's, it's a matter of uh, if they, you know, the cranial uh, uh, cerebral uh, distortion or uh, index uh, changes, I believe. Professor, and uh, how to treat how to treat adolescent uh, microcephaly uh, when they have uh, uh, with the cranial sinusosis when they have uh, epilodema and there is no other uh, uh, sign or symptoms of high ICB. How old is the, the patient? It's not mentioned. They mentioned just in general as an adult adult uh, patient. So I mean, uh, adults, uh, uh, I haven't seen uh, adult uh, uh, keratosynostosis except very few, and most of them, they, they have been followed uh, until they became old. It's very rare that they will develop high ICP later on. Usually, they develop it very early. But uh, if I have a patient with uh, some sort of uh, keratosynostosis and he did very well for many years, and you come with increased ICP, I would have to reinvestigate again uh, and find the reason for in increasing the current pressure. It can be related or it can be unrelated, unrelated like pseudo tumors to the bronchial example or any structural lesions like uh, new onset of hydrocephalus or et cetera. And then I'm gonna act accordingly. So I have to find why he developed high ICP uh, evidence of, uh, regardless of his uh, current sources. Okay. Uh Question regarding the skin uh, closure. Uh, after remodeling of the skull, uh, sometimes we face a difficulty in closing, uh, closure the skin. So uh, any tips regarding this or any preoperative uh, planning for uh, skin graft, for example? No, not that. I, it's always uh, because the head is deformed and smaller and you need a very nice round reconstruction and you put the skin together, there's a gap sometime up to five centimeter or less. And they said, okay, oh my God, how am I gonna close it? You know, usually with just re-stretching of the skin, the skull is very nice and stretchable, uh, you know, uh, structure. You can stretch it and suture it with multiple and uh, in different area, and then come back and do multiple suture all around it. The zigzag will help you a lot in uh, getting better surgery. In some cases, I, you know, did not come nicely. We had to go back in, uh, posteriorly and further dissect the, the uh, skull from the pre, uh, pre, pre, pre to release and give us some more stretching. And in some cases, when you open the, the, the skull from inside, sometimes we have to make a small incision in the upper neurosis, and this will 
increase the more stretching of the scalp and you can get away with it. In most of the cases, I've never put a, a, a skin graft um, and, 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 and find difficulty, but I, 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 this question is very correct always. And that's why, you know, um, uh, you know, especially for seniors who leave the skin for the juniors, they had to be around because uh, I tell you, and most of us have been called many times after I finished the surgery, I left the, uh, the assistant to close, to come back, we have problems in closing. And this is very common and everybody has faced this. But there are, the tips here is to uh, be patient, stretch the scalp carefully, avoid damaging the construct that you have done. And it will come with time, with stretching, and just do multiple social, approximate from all the other end gradually, it will come. Thank you, Professor. Uh, there is uh, so many questions, so we will pick a couple of questions. Uh, there is a couple of questions regarding the uh, sagittal sinus. Uh, what's your advice uh, to preserve the sagittal sinus during the uh, cranial sinusitis uh, repair and to prevent sin uh, sinus injury? Yeah, that's a good question. You know, and you know, although for sagittal sinusitis we would like to resect the uh, the the sinus, the suture, and uh, in most of the cases there is internal ridge. Okay, and sometimes when you dissect you might cause injury. If, if it's stuck and you feel uncomfortable, it's okay to disconnect a different part of the bone, leave some island there. So if you, if you feel there is risk, or if, whenever you dissect, you get some venous blood, just wait, don't, uh, don't do it, go from another place. And sometimes in some cases, I had to leave a small like one to two centimeter bony island from the middle of the, or posterior of the, um, uh, sagittal uh, suture, which is fused, has severe ridging going there. And sometimes these are almost in, it's indenting or splitting even the, uh, the sinus. So be careful in the dissection. If you have a problem with this one, it's okay. Just leave some island and continue with the other reconstruction. This island, with time, it will fuse with the others. So that's a good uh, uh, tips and minimize the, the, the sinus injury. There is a couple of questions regarding the IQ and uh, the asymptomatic. So I will rephrase all the question in one question. In a case of a uh, pediatric uh, patient with only uh, cosmetic uh, uh, disturbance for the family, and there is no sign of high ICP or uh, other, other sign to operate other than the cosmetic, is the early surgical intervention in these cases will uh, give us a better IQ uh, in the future, comparing to late surgical intervention? Uh, you know, our, uh, our data comes from some, some of the literature. Most of it uh, was published in craniofacial journals. And they talk about the outcome of the cognitive and IQ in children. And uh, uh, in, in relation to which suture, usually metopic is number one, uh, and second one will be uh, coronal. If you're gonna uh, address this question and answer this question, if it's a metopic, um, because of the, the, they believe that compression to the frontal lobes or the severe uh, unilateral or even bilateral coronal, where the uh, papers and the, uh, uh, that published and came with talking about the uh, IQ and cognitive function in children who were not treated for um, carcinostosis for a single suture, and they ha there is no evidence uh, for urgent intervention like increased ICP, and they decide not to do anything. They found there is some decline in the preschool uh, performance, okay? But for the sagittal, if the child is fine, I have few uh, children with sagittal with mild deformity, and uh, there's no ICP in most of them, and uh, the cosmesis was not a big issue with the parent, and those are, did very well, actually. I'm trying to just to take as much as we can from the question because we have so many questions. Uh, so we will conclude with this uh, question. Uh, we have multiple uh, questions at the same point. If there is a, uh, a finding of uh, hydrocephalus or Kayari uh, compression in, uh, uh, with association with uh, cranial sinusitis, uh, so which one should go first? Uh, hydrocephalus and cranial sinusitis and Kayari and cranial sinusitis. 
Uh, okay, if, you know, the, the question, I think uh, we have mentioned that briefly during the talk, but uh, the question is very important. And if you have a hydrocephalus and hydrocephalus, large ventricles, and there is uh, a deformity and uh, the deformity timing uh, is not appropriate for the age of the child, it's okay to do a shunt. You leave the chiari, even if the chiari has some symptoms like uh, stridor or lower current neuropathy, again, treat the uh, subretentorial compartment, which is the current synestosis, if possible, or the hydrocephalus. Uh, Sometimes we have to do both, like putting an EVD, do the reconstruction and finish and leave the EVD for some time, and then you can start to wean the patient from the EVD. If you, if you close the vent, the EVD and nothing happens, the child is fine, there's no issues of accumulation quickly, you can decrease, uh, take out the EVD and watch the child. And he might come back for a shunt, but then at least you minimize too many uh, operations. As you know, if you put a shunt you know, with chronic synestosis, uh, with the dissection, there's always a risk of infection of the shunt. So try to avoid this. And if you put a shunt and you didn't do chronic synestosis, the shunt is in your way. In most of the cases, that you have to convert the, the, the Libichon into an EVD for some time, and then you put it again uh, later on. But I would deal with uh, the most symptomatic I feel uh, that I can treat uh, very quickly for the, for the patient. If, if I have to do a Libichon, I would do it. It's okay, not a, not, not a problem. And then you deal with the connection resources repair in a better way and more organized. But I would leave the, the Chiari malformation is the last, I will not operate in the same time for current synestosis and carry too much risk, and, uh, and this is not, uh, uh, and you might not operate, but if you have a carry, then uh, this is something that you have to uh, follow up in the future. Some of them, they require decompression, and some of them become stable. It might not get better radiologically, but at least it can be stable, and they have no symptoms. Uh, last question from Dr. Anwar. Uh, Cranial synestosis due to the metabolic causes like a hypophosphatase with raised ICP in and like five years old uh, patients. Uh, what's your recommendation or what's your strategy for these uh, cases? Um, bone, bone disease, uh, it, it, can, it can present uh, to us in different ways. Some of them with uh, tight, tight skull and they can have a global increased ICP. And those cases are managed with uh, marsupilation. You know, you, you don't have to re reconstruct the head. You just do a simple craniotomy or craniectomy and remodel and make the bone sort of like island and then decrease the, the pressure in those cases. Uh, some of them, they compress the, uh, new, the, the nerve from the commonest one is the optic nerve. And this one requires a decompression either transcranially or endoscopically, you can do that uh, for them. Uh, for, for, so, so the management for those patients, uh, it's not like, uh, no, no, this is not a surgical and you ignore it. No, no, we, we see them, but we have to have an evidence. Uh, if they have a deformed skull only without evidence of uh, uh, cranial nerve compression or no evidence of ICB, I would not uh, treat them. I would not consider uh, uh, surgery for cosmesis for them because the risk uh, for them is higher. They have a lot of other issues. Um, and the complication is, complication is higher. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor. I apologize for all the audience. They ask, uh, and uh, we did not have the time to answer the question. We received uh, so many questions uh, indicating the uh, value of the, this presentation and uh, the uh, effort from uh, Professor uh, Baisa. Uh, thank you very much, Professor, and thank you for the attendee. Uh, see you in the uh, future uh, webinar, inshallah.